Hi, I'm Ozzy from Three Monkeys Amps and Three Monkeys Solderless, and today I thought uh, we'd take a look at this thing. So this is my 100 watt Master Volume 1979 Super Lead, modified by Jose Arnando. Um, let me put this down. So I thought, um, I thought for this video, it might be interesting to just totally let the cat out of the bag um, and go ahead and open it up, give some, uh, give you a tour through it, fly by, close up of the parts, and then go through a very detailed, almost too detailed um, description of the circuit, how it works, what the different parts are, trace it all out for you, to the point where I think if you have some knowledge about amplifiers, you'll be able to build a copy of this. So I think you're gonna find it pretty interesting if you're into Jose's amplifiers and the guys that use them. Um, this one has seen the road, it's been on the road with somebody uh, that everybody knows. Um, so it should be interesting to see what's inside. So I'm going to try to break this video up into a couple of pieces so that you can kind of digest it. But it's going to be very in-depth. It's going to be long. So if you're not prepared for that, you might just want to skip around a little bit and just kind of enjoy some of the amp porn. But we're going to be doing some serious in-depth discussions about the circuit and what made the Jose amplifiers unique. Um, so. Stay tuned and let's get started. So hey, um, just doing a quick uh, flyby of the amplifier as it's out of the chassis. Just wanted to show you everything there. Um, so over here we have our inspection tag. As you can see, um, this was at 1979 Marshall, 100 watt, uh, master volume. Seems to have been wired by Karen. So thank you, Karen. Um, let's go through. We've got some tube sockets. This was added. Um, that's an original, another original hole that probably contained an AT7, probably a tube loop, but it wasn't in there when I got the amplifier. Um, there's another original socket. We got our original Marshall power sockets. They're all labeled 60A7 EL34. I don't know if that's Jose's writing or if that's the tour um, tech. The guitar tech that maintained this amplifier on tour. Um, this was a touring amp at one point. I won't say who it belonged to, but you all know them. Um, let's see, let's go through it. We got a, um, a stock daily 5050, which are for the preamp and the cathode follower. We got our stock choke, right? We got our stock choke there. We got ourselves a, you know, that's a, a Drake choke. This is a Drake output transformer stock. Um, the power transformer is a Drake stock. We've got our um, phase inverter um, filter capacitor, a stock daily 5050. We have two daily uh, 5050s in series for the screens. And then we got these guys. <laughs> Those happen to be 630 mic filter capacitors. God only knows why. Um, to me, that's kind of like supplying, uh, you know, a, a gerbil water feeder with a rain barrel. There just ain't enough current draw to, 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 to uh, justify these sorts of things. I don't know why Jose did it. I mean, in my opinion, it stresses things out way too much. Um, but it was in the amp, so I'm leaving it alone. I wouldn't have done it, but that's all good. Um, so let's go to the back of the amp. Uh, and there we have the provenance for it. Arandando amplification, right? By Jose. 4463A Van Noyes Boulevard, Sherman Oaks, California, 91403. Uh, we have his old phone number there, obviously. Uh, don't call it. Uh, it probably is going to somebody else now who probably has better things to do than to answer the phone asking for him. Um, here we have uh, some of the controls that were added. This is the slave, all right, which is basically a line out right here, um, marked by the road crew. Um, a preamp out, okay, that's that's the slave out. The relocated presence control, which is kind of cool, also marked. We have our output jacks. The impedance selector was replaced with this three-way, right, instead of that goofy plug-in thingy. Um, which was there before. 
And then we have here the remote standby, which is kind of, in my opinion, an identifying feature of the Jose amp and the user. All right, and then we have our mains input and our two fuses, which are stock values. Okay, so let's go to the front of the amp. Okay, so we got it turned around. Um, you can see again, power transformer, the tomato cans, the dailies, the output transformer, little, uh, little sticker on there, got our choke. There's the other uh, preamp can. Um, we have our four inputs. Um, you can see it's labeled right there, gain for this, push pull. Um, and then we have a uh, preamp in right here. Our other two inputs. We have a sticker there, pull both, volume two, Let's push pull. Um, go over here, we have just our standard volume one. Uh, we have our treble, our middle, bass, and the sticker up here says MVC, Master Volume Control, and it's a push pull. Right. Then we have our standby and power on. JMP, the serial number. So that's basically the look of the front of the amp. Um, next, we're going to take a fly close up look at the components inside the amp. So stay tuned for that coming right up. All right, so I got the amplifier upside down, turned on its back, and now we're going to go look inside of the thing. And uh, I'm going to give you an overview of it. And then we're going to go through um, just the values of things of the different capacitors and resistors and we're going to show you some close-ups of some different parts and things. Okay, so let's start on the front end. All right, so what do we got? We got a little push-pull up from the front, some shieldy cable, we got uh, three input jacks, two are plastic jacks, one is this metal jack. We've got another push-pull, it's a one meg as well. This is also a one meg. Um, we have a volume control, which is a one meg, and this is a 4700 puff bypass capacitor. Um, we have our treble control, our metal control right here, and our bass control. And these are stock Marshall values, a one meg, uh, 25K, um, 250K on the treble. Um, and then right here we have this guy, which is a dual element, 500K audio, with a double pull, double throw, push pull switch on it. And this is the secret. This is the Jose. This is what makes a Jose a Jose. Nothing else. This is what he came up with, in my opinion, is the real deal of what makes a Jose a Jose. All right, so we've got that. Uh, we've got our uh, power and standby. We have our screen filter capacitors, which are the dual 50s. Um, got what were these, 56K? Um, bleeder resistors on them. They're in series for the screens. We have our mains, the two giant tomato cans. Um, 630 mic. Good God. Ugh. Why? Um, 630 mic um, in series for or for uh, way too much filtering. <laughs> we have another uh, stock daily 5050, and this is for the phase inverter back in here. Um, Okay, we've got our fuses, stock fuses. We have our sockets. I've replaced the screen resistors on the sockets with 1Ks. The originals were, um, ah, they were looking kind of old and burned up. And I've worked on the amp a little bit. So keep it up, keep it maintained. Uh, so we got our 1Ks. Um, now let's go to the back of the amplifier. Um, we got some interesting things here. Right here is what we we're pointing out on the back of the amplifier, the remote standby. And what this is basically is just a simple stereo jack, metal switchcraft stereo jack, which is connected to the cathode on this last power tube. And every cathode on each power tube is wired in series and then goes to ground through the jack. Um, and then if you insert a foot switch into there, you can break the connection then between the cathodes and ground and shut the amp up. And there you have your remote standby switch. So that's interesting. Um, let's go down a little further. We have um, our output jack, um, a series of three of them. 
which are in series coming off of our selector. Um, and then we have over here our presence control, which was relocated from the front. It's one of the uh, newer models, or I should say the more modern uh, presence control variety. It has a 0.68 capacitor, 25K uh, potentiometer, and a 4K7 um, sort of ground reference off the input of the potentiometer. We go down a little bit further, and we have the slave out, which is basically just a line out. And it connects to the output jack, right? So the output transformer, secondary, whatever you're connected to, is connected to the input of this potentiometer right here, which I believe is a 25K. We have a 10K um, sort of drop in resistor right here. And then it has its ground reference as well back at the jacks. All right, so that's our slave out, which you would obviously use for doing a line out for a rack or something like that. All right, so now let's go through um, the values of everything that we've got. We've got uh, our little auxiliary board here, which is a uh, four terminal tag strip grounded center through the turret. Um, we have V1, oh, let's call this V surrogate, which is the gain stages. Um, and we can talk about that a little bit right now. Um, all right, so let's go through the parts that make up the gain stage. Um, so the B plus is connected here at the junction of the two 100 Ks feeding will be the stock V1AB. So all three plates for these tubes are deriving their plate voltage from the same place, which would be this 10 K and it's associated 50 mic filter capacitor under the board. That goes to this point right here, which begins our plate resistors. We have a 100K going from here to here. Then from here, we go through another 100K down here to the plate of the tube. And so that makes our plate resistor effectively a 200K plate resistor. Um, we could talk about the cathode. The cathode is right here. Um, the cathode, at, uh, its circuit is right here. It's associated RC network. Um, we have a 0.68 bypass capacitor hot glued to the chassis and directly soldered ground reference to the chassis itself. And it has a 2K7 carbon comp um, resistor for the cathode. Um, then we can go to the plate again. So the 220, 220 excuse me, two 100Ks for a 200K plate resistor are uh, exiting right here through a 0.01 um, film cap, which then come out up to our one meg push-pull arrangement. And we'll, in the next video, um, we'll be discussing the circuit in detail, so you'll know how this all works, but I just wanted to give you a parts reference. Um, here we have the cathode for here, which is standard V1A. It's your stock 820 ohm, 330 or so mic bypass capacitor. Here we have the 0.68 cathode for V1B. And it's associated um, 1K, actually. Let me make, no, excuse me, 2K7. Again, 2K7 um, cathode resistor. We have a missing 68K resist input resistor right here, but the original 68K input mixer resistor here. We have a 0.02. Our two 100K plate resistors for V1A and B. This is the coupling cap for V1A. This is the coupling cap for V1B. And it is a 0.002. And if anybody recognizes that particular model and look at capacitor, you know you've seen it in another amp out there, particularly the golden amp for those that are in the know. Um, let's keep going. We have another pair of 68K um, input mixer resistors here um, okay and associated uh, wiring to those which we'll discuss in detail we have our two 470k mixer resistors which go to the cathode follower um, the bright side as if this is I mean a stock 70s type circuit 500 puff 470k 470k we could go into the cathode right now um, we have a the cathode for v1a which is a Underneath there, you can't see it, but underneath there is an 820 ohm resistor, and the bypass is a 0.68, pretty standard. We have 100K for the cathode for V2B uh, for the, the uh, second half of the cathode follower. And here we have the treble capacitors, capacitors, 
right? So what do we got? We actually have a 500 puff, and then we have a, well, let's get, let's get it exactly right. We have a 3300 picofarad capacitor. So these are in parallel for making, what, 3800 picofarads. So that's a pretty big treble capacitor, right? Then we have a stock arrangement of a, a 0.02 and a 0.02. Um, our slope resistor is stock 33K. Um, this is the phase inverter right here. Pretty stock. We have a 0.02 entrance. We have a 1 meg and 1 meg grid reference resistors. Right here, it looks like we have a 2, that's weird, 2K7 um, cathode resistor. And the tail on the long tail pair is a 10K. Uh, and a 0.1 on the grid of the B section of the cathode, or rather the um, phase motor. The feedback resistor is 100K. Um, and then we can go into the uh, plate and grid arrangements of the phase inverter, or the, the power section. Our plate resistors for the phase inverter are 82K, 100K, with a 47 puff uh, snubber for your parasitics. Uh, we, with a couple of capacitors are 0.02s. And we have 82K mixer resistors back in there, two little carbon camp jammies. Jammies. Um, so then we have uh, two dropping resistors. What are those? 2K7. And that looks like a, what, a 10K? Okay, that's for your string with your choke input, your screen supply, blah, blah, blah. Going down for your dropping. I should have mentioned the two dropping resistors right here are both 10Ks. Feeding the 400, or rather the 50 mic uh, can capacitor that's under the board. All right, so back to the... Uh, Dropping resistors, we have there are two dropping resistors. Um, right here we have the bias circuit, okay? So we have our input, all right, our range, our associated uh, diode. Uh, we have two, what are those, 10 mic um, bias capacitors. Looks like the range resistor was modified, I guess to put in, um, you know, 6CA7s. So we have our bias trim pot and our uh, dropping resistor right there. We have our full wave bridge right here, which is untouched. God help those guys when they have to power up those cans every time. God help that power transformer too. Um, those giant, <laughs> giant 630 cans. It's like supplying a, a rabbit water feeder with like a brain barrel. Anyway, um, there's our bias circuit. Uh, let's see. So these are probably, what, 4,004, 4,007 diodes, something like that. Nothing special. All right, so that's basically the inside of the amplifier. Um, Close-up look at the parts. Uh, now I'm going to go ahead and throw this thing up on the, on the uh, stand, and we're going to get into detail about exactly how this amplifier works and how it's wired. Okay, so we've got the amplifier upside down on its back on the table and a good overhead shot. And now we're gonna go through explaining how the signal travels through this amplifier. We're gonna go through all the different parts. We're gonna go in through tracing it through all the different inputs. We're gonna explain in totality how the Jose Master works, which is really the innovation that Jose came up with. Um, and we're going to do it in such a way that if you're an amp guy, you're gonna be able to build one of these. And this is my particular Jose. Um, I know there's many mods that he's done, and they're all a little bit different probably, so this one is uh, maybe useful as it's unique as it sits. So to trace the signal, I got my multimeter. I'm going to set it up for continuity, which basically means that when, um, I'm going to put the meter up here, uh, that when I touch the two probes together, when there's a direct connection, such as through a wire or a directly soldered connection, you're going to hear... A nice loud beep, right? So that'll verify that, in fact, what I'm telling you is right. Um, all right, so let's uh, let's start at the input, at the hot input, which is the metal uh, input jack that we described earlier in the video. That's our cascaded gain stage, and I've got one of our solderless connectors here um, to uh, start tracing the signal with. So first, let's verify the ground. So we have a chassis ground off the jacket. Okay, now where does the input go? Here to here, directly to the pin. 
All right, so directly to the grid of the surrogate B side tube. As we said, the A side isn't connected. There is no grid stopper resistor. It's straight in. No 33K, no 68K, no nothing. Straight in. All right, so as we said for the cathode for that, we have a 2K7 and a 0.68. And the plate resistor is made up of two 100Ks for a total of 200K. Now, um, we're exiting through the plate. Uh, the plate's coupled with um, this 0.01. Where is the 0.01 headed? To our one meg volume control right here with the push pull on it. And we'll discuss the push pull in a second. Um, it, uh, the wiper of the uh, one meg right here goes where? Right here. All right, so that's to what would be one of the original 68Ks um, that would originally have gone to the two upper and lower uh, lead or bright inputs, okay? So we're going from the volume control to the 68K, through the 68K, where is it headed to? Okay, it's headed to what is originally V1B, which would be the side of the tube dedicated to the lead or bright channel on a stock amplifier of this model. So we could basically see that we've cascaded this gain stage into what would be the input or bright input of a stock Marshall super lead of this year, okay? So um, the cathode and cathode resistor are a 2K7 resistor and a 0.68, which are our stock values. Um, the coupling capacitor, so the plate resistor is 100K, right? And the coupling capacitor for that side is what? A 0.002. All right, and where is the 0.002 going? Right here to our one meg volume control, which is the stock location for that particular input for its volume control, has the associated 4700 puff bright capacitor. And where is that headed to? Right here, where you expect it to be, at the junction of the 470K mixer resistors that enter the cathode follower, the bright side, of course, which is the 470K with the 500 puff bypass. So it's pretty straightforward. You got a, a gain stage going straight into this uh, stock stage as it would be, um, and then directly into a stock arrangement of the cathode follower. All right, so that's our input right there. Now, what does this push pull do, you might ask? Well, that defeats this gain stage and basically shunts the output of the plate to ground. So when it's pulled out, it's functional, right? We're not grounded here. Push it in, this output becomes grounded. And that basically is for what is, we're gonna discuss the jump channels feature, which is this push-pull pot right here. All right, so let's go into the next input, which would be the normal input right here, okay? That's what would normally be considered the normal input on an amp has its ground reference. Now, where is it headed to, right? Where is it going to? Right here, 68K input mixer resistors, exactly where you would expect it to go. From there, where is it headed? Okay, we got to get actually to the other side of the resistor. Now, where is it going? To the grid of V1A, exactly where you would expect it to be in a, in a standard Marshall of this year. Um, and V1A's associated cathode is a 820 ohm and like a 330 mic bypass capacitor. Just what you would expect for sort of the normal channel. All right, so where is it headed out of? The plate resistor is 100K and we have a 0.02 coupling capacitor. Now, where is that guy going to? Exactly where you would expect it to go on a stock amp to its associated volume control, volume control two, right? Now, where is it headed out of volume control to? Once again, exactly where you'd expect it to go, to the input of the 470K mixer resistors, only on the non-bypassed, non-bright side of it. So, and then directly into the cathode follower. All right, so that's pretty cool. And it has a push-pull on it. So what does that do? Well, you can see these are the two mix, the two input mixers, right? Two 68K networks associated to the two input or two channels, so to speak. Right now, nothing, right? But if we pull this out, they're connected. 
And that was the same mod that was in the Golden Amp, right? That you guys that are in the know know about. This is a very standard sort of Jose thing. It allows you, instead of jumping the channels outside of the amp, to jump them internally. So if you're plugged into this amp, this side, you can jump and use both channels, all right, excluding this gain stage, which is why you would want to sort of defeat it to keep it quiet. And then you can pull this out and jump both your channels together and get that jump sound, right? So let's go into the other input, the last one that's left, which would have been our normal lead input on a stock Marshall, right? That upper right hand input, the money hole. Um, let's see where this one goes, right? Exactly where you'd expect it, to the 68K input grid, input uh, uh, rather network, uh, from the other side of the 68K resistor, where are we going? Exactly where you'd expect it to go, into V1B's grid. All right, so that's stock, and like we said before, it's associated cathode, the 2K7, the 0.68, the 100K plate, and the 0.002 film capacitor connected to our, you know, exactly where you expect it to be, our volume, or number two volume control with the bypass capacitor going into our bright side of our mixers. So, um, and also when, like I said, when you're in this channel or that channel, when this is pulled out, you're in both, all right? So that's the jump feature, the internal jump feature, very simple. These look like, you know, fairly complicated, you know, mega switches, but really all they're doing is one function, closing or open close or open one pole that's it um but you know back in the day this is what alan bradley had so this is what you get or cts right today we have very small sort of um push pull pots and the elements are very small the switches are very small this looks way more complicated than it is all right so let's continue on and we're going to continue on into um the heart of the Jose, which is the Jose Master. Okay, now let's start explaining the Jose Master. And uh, to do that, I think what we should do is start uh, doing some diagrams right here, so we can we can show you what's going on. So we're going to start by sort of drawing out the tone stack, um, some of the tone controls that are related to this, and some of the tubes. So, so I'm going to draw that for you right now. Um, so let's start with, um, let's say the treble control, right? Let's put that up there. Okay. There's your treble control, and this is a 250K treble. All right, or a triple. <laughs> um, we're going to put in the cathode follower tube. All right, so this is your cathode follower. And this is going to be um, one cathode pin and the second cathode pin. So this is for A and this is for B, B side, and this is your standard cathode follower with a 100K, you know, uh, plate to grid. Um, and now we're going to draw in the associated circuit up here. So what do we have? We have here a cathode resistor, a bypass capacitor, right, which would be connected here. And as we said, this was what? An 820 ohm, and this was what? A 0.68. Okay, and this is the ground. So a standard cathode, you know, for a cathode follower for the A section. Um, now let's go to the B section. You would have, obviously right here, a 100K. Okay, and that's connected here. All right, so this is um, gonna derive a higher voltage, which is going to drive your tone stack. So let's draw in the tone stack, okay? So we'll start with the treble capacitor, or in this case, capacitors. Okay, so we have what? A 500 and a 3300, all right? And that is obviously connected to that point on the treble control. Um, let me draw in the middle control just for, for, just for reference as well, just so we can see where everything is, right? So this is a, a mid, 25K mid, okay? So back to drawing in the... Um, right here what we've got. So we have our, uh, right here we have our slope resistor, all right, which is a 33K. And then we're gonna draw in 
our two other capacitors, which are 0.02 and 0.02. All right, so this is basically our tone stack arrangement. Um, you would normally have, which we do in this amp, this connected to here, obviously, you know. Um, and then this one um, would be connected, just to verify on this. Um, yep. That is correct. Okay. Now, uh, let's keep going um, and let's draw in our phase inverter, right? Because that's going to be relevant to this. And we're just going to do basically um, very easily right here. We'll, we'll do it small in this area right here. We got ourselves our 0.02, right? Which goes into the grid. You know what I'm talking about. And then obviously we have, you know, this network here, right? These being the two one megs, and this one being, in this case, a 2K7, which is kind of strange. Our little 10K tail and the 0.1. Okay, but for all purposes, we're just really looking at that. All right, so now let's draw the, the really important thing. And I'm going to use a big marker for this so that you can really sort of see, emphasize what we're looking at. So let's start drawing in um, the Jose Master. Okay, so we've got a dual element. A dual deck all right so this would represent the two ganged potentiometers both of which have a 500k resistance and then we're going to draw in the switch okay so this is the switch in its related terminals all right double pole double throw so we're going to label this obviously this is a 500k audio this one's a 500k audio and this is a double pole double throw okay um and in this switch uh this is the common right and these are the switched terminals so we're going to verify now how that all works on this amplifier for you with the uh, continuity tester so we've got it now in, in pushed in mode so we're going to call this push mode and these two are connected pull it these two are connected and these two no longer are. So we know that this, um, we can go ahead and mark these, that this would be in push connection, right? And this would be in pull. So that's how they're gonna be connected. So when your knob is pushed in, these two are connected. And when your knob is pulled out, these two are connected. So I think that's pretty straightforward for how this push-pull works. Now, you might have noticed something in this. And if you have, then you already know what a Jose Master is. Um, now, what you would normally have, I've got a piece of wire here. Normally in a Marshall, these two points would always be connected, right? This to here, this would always be connected. The 100K would always be connected to the slope resistor and to the treble capacitors or treble capacitor. Um, Jose broke that connection. And what did he do then? Well, then he took the lead from the cathode, right, which is connected to the 100K, so this has voltage on it, and he brought it up to the push-pull, to the switch, to the push side, of the double pull, double throw on one side, okay? So that's pretty interesting. From there, what has he got, right? We're looking over here. So from there, what has he got? He's got a, a resistor, right? And then he's got this capacitor, this big blue capacitor, right? So we're gonna mark those in. Now, what are they? Well, I cut open the heat shrink and this is a 10K, okay? And then this is a 0.22. 0.22, not 0.022, but 0.22. So that's a very large capacitor. Jose wanted the whole kit and caboodle getting through there. And that capacitor is connected to the, basically um, the element of the uh, 500K um, pot, the lower deck on the 500K pot, all right? Um, <clears throat> now, the output of the 500K pot, the wiper, right? Which would normally, be going 
you know, as your output, so to speak, is going to this terminal right here, which is the pole terminal. And we have both of these grounded. Okay, the other side of the trace of the um, element grounded. Um, and if you're unfamiliar with how pots work, I'll just give you a quick thing. You've got an element, right? Which is like a resistor, okay? And then you have a wiper. Now this element is inside the potentiometer and it's a trace of carbon sort of in a semi, in a circle. And this wiper blade sits on that trace of carbon. And as you turn the knob, it moves along the trace of carbon, which increases or decreases the resistance. All right, so that's generally where you would have your variable output, right, the center. So that's connected to here, which is on the pole side. All right, so um, let's talk about what that does. All right, um, let's also, um, well, where does this common go to? That's important, right? So the common itself, let's trace that out, right? So we have um, this point, as we said right here, going directly to the tube, right? Okay. Then we have our, our, um, our common. Well, we're going to pull this out so that we know exactly where it's going to. Oh, it's going to the 33K. Interesting. All right. So let's draw that in. So we've got it. Jump over that. I'm going to come down. And it goes right to here. Okay. So we're going from here into the what you could consider the input of the tone stack itself. Whereas normally, you know, this would be connected. Jose broke that connection and brought it up to a switch where it could either be restored or left broken. All right. So now let's um, continue on uh, with the switch and uh, show you what else uh, is connected where. So um, now on a normal master volume Marshall, you would have this 250K, the treble controls wiper connected to another volume pot, which would then variably adjust the signal level before it goes directly into the phase inverter, right? So you'd have the 250K pot wiper connected to the input of a, a potentiometer like a 500K or a one meg. No different here. Upper deck potentiometer, we're gonna bring that over to the wiper of the treble pot, okay? Now, where else does that particular um, lead go to? So let's verify where it goes, because we can see right here, there's this big wire right here, right? So let's verify that. No, yeah, maybe. We gotta get a good, uh, get ourselves a, uh, there we go. Okay, so we have what? We have it going to this terminal right here. So let's draw that in. Okay, so that's on the pull side. The treble is connected to the pot as well as this pull side of the double pull, double throw. All right, so then, then let's look at the wiper of that upper deck. Now normally on, an, on a regular master volume marshal, this would be connected to the input of the phase inverter, right? Which would allow you the output the variable output, the variable output of the pot to connect to the phase inverter, which would be the next place it's supposed to go. So let's see where this goes in the circuit. So I'm gonna bring over here, it goes here, all right? So let's go ahead and draw that in, all right? Skips over, right to there. So that's interesting. Now we have one last terminal to describe in this uh, circuit, in this area right here. So let's see where that goes. And that's the common on the other double pull, double throw right here. Okay, let's see where that goes. I'm guessing it goes right here. And it does, which is the input capacitor for the phase inverter. So let's draw that on our diagram. Okay. Um, let's bring it like that. And there you go. Okay, so there is your your diagram. Now it's missing one part, but we're going to talk about that in depth a little bit more. For the purposes right now, this is all we need. Let's discuss the function. What is happening here? Let's first discuss it in push mode. When this particular knob is pushed in, all right, we have, let's trace the signal. The cathode follower 
going to here. All right, you have a 10K, but we can ignore this, but I'm going to describe it anyway. A 10K to a 0.02, or rather 0.22, into this 500K, uh, which is going to this point, which is not connected to anything at this point. It's off in space. So it just has a 500K reference to ground, which for all intents and purposes is a, is a little bit of a load, but not a big deal. We can ignore it. So let's ignore that, what's hanging off of it. Was, in a sense, it's just a, a 500 and what, 10K uh, reference to ground um, at all frequencies. So we have, the, again, once again, the cathode follower, the cathode connected to this point. When it's in push mode, these two are connected, these two terminals. So then it's extending out here and it's going into the input of the tone stack itself, the 33K and treble um, capacitor junction. So in effect, it's restoring the connection that you would expect to see in a normal cathode follower in a Marshall, right? It's restoring that. Um, let's, let's continue on uh, with the push mode because we have this other side to account for as well, right? So we have the treble, which, is the out, which would be normally going to a master volume, right? Going to the input of a 500K pot, the output of which is coming to right here which is in push mode connected to right here which is connected to the input of the phase inverter so in all effect with the switching you have a connection directly from here to the input of this upper deck of the potentiometer the wiper then is directly connected via switching to the 0.02 so in push mode you have a standard marshall master volume pre phase inverter okay it's just a 500K placed after the 250K treble pot before it reaches the phase inverter. Nothing special there, right? Okay, just a normal one. Let's pull out the double pull, double throw pot and do an analysis of the circuit then. Okay, so now we have, again, the cathode from the cathode follower coming to this point, going through this 10K to this 0.02, right into the lower deck of the 500k the output of which the wiper is coming to this point which is connected to the common which is then going to the 33k so what have we done we've basically inserted this 500k pot the lower deck of the twin pot arrangement this 500k pot is now inserted here right so this is where the variability comes into play. Um, that is where the master volume sits between the cathode and the tone stack. So that is a unique thing. I have not seen that in another amplifier. Now, somebody out there may know of another amplifier that has this circuit in it. And you, I'd be, it'd be great if you told me. I always love learning things. Um, but, um, you know, this could be in the train wreck pages. I don't know. I mean, it's been a long time since I've read the train wreck pages. And I remember talking to Ken Fisher back, you know, back in the day. And he told me that he had like a hundred master volume ideas. So I'm guessing this was probably one of them. Um, whether it was described in the, in the train wreck pages, I can't remember. Uh, but, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if it was in there. I mean, that master volume, the post phase inverter master volume with the dual pot one that everybody uses that's attributed to somebody. I can't remember the person's name again. You know, that was in the train wreck pages. So anyway, um, it's funny how Ken gets left out a lot. I feel bad about that. So back to this um, arrangement. So you can see that's really the unique thing is that he put a master volume in here. All right, so now the, the next thing that's, that's unusual about this particular um, amplifier is kind of hidden, um, but it's right here, all right? And that is a pair of Zener diodes, all right? Going from the one side lug to the other side lug. So I'll just draw that on a, um, down here, all right? Just to, because it's kind of cluttered up here already. I don't want to make a lot of confusion. So this terminal relates to this, this terminal relates to this, 
this terminal relates to this. And what we have there is a network of two zeners, okay? And we're gonna draw in the zener, right? There's uh, one of them. All right, that's one zener. And we're gonna draw in the other zener. And forgive me a little bit because I'm dyslexic and sometimes things don't look as good as they should when I draw them. Um, it's weird, it's like, I don't know. That's a story for another day. So these are two zener diodes, all right, connected back to back. Um, and these happen to be, um, in my amplifier, an A20351, all right? So this is an A20351. It could be a seven, um, as I'm reading my handwriting, but I think it's a five one. So it's either a seven or a one. But anyway, you're not gonna find these. <laughs> when we were doing uh, for Three Monkeys, doing the Jose um, limited run, I think we made like 10 of them that were copies of this amplifier. I had to get them, oh my God, was it a pain in the butt. So you're not gonna find them. But anyway, you can look them up and find something similar, that's fine. So let's talk about these zeners and what the hell they're there for, right? Why, what, what are these zeners doing? And this is another great um, innovation, maybe not an innovation, but another great thing about um, the Jose amplifier. Let's talk about something. Let's talk about clipping, distortion, all right? So let's talk about what distortion is. And to do that, um, let's, just, let's look at waveforms. So I'm gonna draw you some waveforms here, all right? So um, we'll start with like, if you, you would see on a scope, all right? So let's start with a little graph here, all right? And this is gonna be voltage, and this is gonna be time, all right? And uh, normally you, this would be zero volt, but no. On a scope, let's say this right here is our zero volt line, okay? because we have a positive and negative, right? A duty cycle. So let's go ahead and let's draw in a nice clean waveform, all right? There we go. All right, now this is the waveform. See how nice and round it is like on the ocean? This is the waveform that you would expect to find on a very clean sounding amplifier. You know, set very clean like, um, you know, a Fender Deluxe Reverb on one with a Stratocaster going through it, playing a nice, perfectly tuned A note. You might find something like this at 440 cycles per second. Um, and the voltage would be, you know, related to the tube and where you measured it along um, inside of the amplifier. A preamp tube would obviously have lower peak voltages than an output tube would. Um, but that's really not important for right now. This just remember that this is positive voltage and then it goes negative then it goes positive and goes negative, so to speak. All right, for the purpose of this. Now, what is distortion? Let's look at a distorted wave. All right, so once again, we're going to draw our little voltage over time, put our zero volt line in, all right, our baseline. Um, distortion is going to look, well, something like this. All right, and this is what's known as like a square wave. All right, it's flat, right? What are we missing? We're missing, we're missing those little uh, nice rounded tops. Now, this is what you hear when you hear distortion. This is why it sounds the way it does is because the waveform has been compressed. It's been clipped, so to speak. It's been squished. Now, how does a tube do that? Well, basically, what we were talking about before, that this is zero volts, this is, let's say, X, right? And X would be how much volts, or what this, this particular tube is capable of conducting before it starts reaching its ceiling and is no longer able to, to go higher. It just levels off, right? So what ends up happening is that this waveform, as the voltage, as the signal that you're sending to it gets bigger, as in if you put multiple stages together where you're reamplifying a signal, 
one gain stage into another, making it bigger, making it bigger, making it bigger. Um, eventually, it's going to hit the roof of the tube. And when it does, it's going to flatten. All right? And that is what you hear as distortion, that flattening, that compression, that clipping. Okay? So this is usually done over a period of multiple tube gain stages. Like the more you put together, the flatter this is going to get and the more distorted it's going to sound, right? Well, let's say you didn't want to put in like five gazillion tube stages to get yourself a really squared off wave, all right? Or a squared off wave. What can you do? What's another solution to this problem? Zener diodes. What do Zener diodes do? They clamp. They clamp what? Voltage, and they clamp it at a particular level that's built into the design of the zener. All right, so let's look at um, what happens if you put a zener in. All right, so we have our nice wave like this. Okay, now let's say that this is at the right here at the very top. We're just going to use numbers, right? Let's say 10, because that's a nice even number. And let's say down here is 10. Okay, let's say we use a, a zener that has a rating of let's say, oh, five, okay? So that's about halfway, All right? So five right there, what does it do? That's the roof now. So all this goes away. It's clamped. The zener clamps it down. So what do you end up with? A nice flat top, right? That's a distorted wave. The zener has created this sort of waveform just simply in one foul swoop, slicing off the tops of these waveforms. Now, as you can see, the bottom, well, nothing happened to it. Well, that's because the zener is polarized, right? It's orientated, it has one way. It's a one way street, so to speak. Positive this way, negative that way. So as we saw in the circuit, we've got these two zeners back to back, right? So that means you've got one zener at positive and one at negative. And then this one goes ahead and chops off the bottom of the waveform as it relates to zero volts. Okay, so now you have an effect. Let me get my marker um, so you can see what happens. Now with the two zeners, this is what your waveform is. Okay. That's what the waveform looks like. So this is what's known as symmetrical clipping, as in both sides of the cycle are clipped evenly or symmetrically. Now, if it were asymmetrical clipping, let's say you put a different zener here, you could clip this one a little bit differently, or if you put two on one side and one on the other, you could clip it differently on one side than the other, or if you only use one, one side of the form would be clipped and the other side wouldn't. Um, that is, you know, all about taste in terms of diodes. Uh, Jose preferred to use a symmetrical clip, hence the two 20357 diodes back to back. Now, um, let's go back into um, the circuit itself again, and let's talk about some of these other parts. Well, what's this 10K resistor about? Why is it there? Okay. Well, that's what's known as like, let's say a compliance resistor, okay? And that is in line with the zeners, right? Because our zener is really right here, right? Or I'm gonna draw it in this time, um, just for, because you've already sort of seen where it is um, and it's a little cluttered, right? So those are our two zeners, right? So this is in line in series with the two zeners. And what a compliance, um, sort of resistor does is it determines the threshold along with the rating of the zeners as to what level the signal gets clipped and how bad. All right, so let's look at, um, let's look at like another waveform, all right? Um, let's draw another one of these little graphs here and let's put in our, our big waveform, right? Um, we have our zero volt line again going through the middle, okay? Now, let's say you had a very small compliance diode, or rather a small, small compliance resistor compared to a very high compliance resistor. Let's say you have like a 100K or you have a 1K. All right, a 1K would clip at this level. 
100K, it wouldn't clip at all. The whole signal would duck underneath the Zener and the Zener wouldn't even see it. It'd be like, hey, signal, where are you? Nowhere near its effective range, so it's just gonna pass by the Zeners and gonna look at it and say, eh, it's way above my ceiling, I'm letting it go through, or way below my ceiling, I'm letting it go through. So as the, we go 2K, 3K, 4K, so as the resistor gets larger, the effect of the Zener gets lower and lower, okay? So why would you want to do that? What was, what's the point of all that? Selection of the, of the compliance resistor as well as the, what kind of Zener you're using. Well, that's another genius thing, right? Um, and it has to do with this. Let's say you're playing distorted guitar, right? And then you roll your volume back and you want it to clean up. Well, if this resistor is too low, the Zener is still going to see that signal and it's going to smush it and it's going to distort it. But if this compliance diode and the Zeners are selected correctly or for that purpose correctly, I should say, because there is no correct, there's only purpose. Um, when you roll that volume control down, that signal level is going to slide right under the Zener and it's not going to see it. It's not going to touch it. So it's going to remain clean. So you're going to have a guitar that cleans up and then when you go full bore out, those zeners are going to see everything and they're going to squish that form back down again and you're going to have a square wave. So on a, on a, on a, when, the, when it's a very low signal, the zeners aren't going to see it. So this is a very dynamic circuit, right? With the, with the, uh, with the combination of the A20357 with the 10K. Those create a very um, sort of dynamic circuit that will clean up when your volumes roll down. So that to me is the second part of the genius of using those diodes and how, um, you know, how Jose did it. So um, I think we pretty much have explained how uh, Jose did what he did, how he got what he got, and how the whole thing is wired up. Um, so I think we can... Uh, we can leave it for here, and I think that if you're if you're familiar with amplifiers and wanted to build a Jose, that I've given you enough information, I think, um, to go ahead and, and build a copy of this particular amplifier. If you have any questions um, that aren't covered, that I didn't cover in one of these, you know, segments, um, go ahead and, and leave me a, a a comment, and I promise I'll answer it if it's reasonable. Um, if it's something that you know was covered in there and you just didn't watch the video, or you just, you know, oh, so, oh, I saw Jose, I'm not gonna watch the video, I'm just gonna ask the questions that I've spent the last, you know, hour <laughs> answering or describing to you, I'm not gonna answer it. You know, I'll refer you to the video. This is like, you know, homework. Did you read the material? You didn't? All right, well, read the material and come back to class. So uh, we'll leave it here. And uh, like I said, leave it in the comment section if you have any questions about how any of this stuff works. And like I said before, um, if you don't know a lot about amplifiers, please don't mess with these things, especially when you're dealing with amplifiers with filter capacitors like this. Um, they'll store enough current in there to melt your fillings and weld your zipper shut. So if you get hit by this amplifier, I don't know what will happen to you, and it's not going to be good. I mean, I've been electrocuted a few times, but, you know, never with a current passing through my heart. Um, I always have a way of getting around <laughs> protecting myself. But I've been hit a few times and it's not fun. Um, so please, 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 please do not start messing around with this stuff if you don't know how to work safely around high voltage and you don't know your way around one of these amplifiers because it will bite you. So anyway, thanks for watching. And uh, check out some of the other videos. And um, in the next one, I think maybe we'll we'll put some tubes in this. Maybe tomorrow or the next day and bias it up. And then we'll play it through the Oxbox and see how it sounds. So anyway, thanks again. And I'll speak to you later.